good. Stream status is good. Can anyone in the audience see or hear us? It says we're streaming. It says we're live. But they're currently discussing the temperature in Montreal, Quebec. And Brunswick. Aha! Larry says howdy. Does he, does he, is he saying howdy to us or is he saying howdy to them? That's a question. I just want to state it appears to be disgustingly hot in Brunswick. Where yes, is... I'm guessing that yes, they can hear us. Oh, but will they wish they did? Yes, we hear. Says we Tom hear. Okay. We, I cool. am here. All right. Um, cool. No, Chad. I am doing this all by myself. I was, I was, but this is the simple version, right? The, the space hangout is a whole other level of shenanigans, but I'm not going to be bringing in a bunch of pictures the way Chad did last week. And I'm probably not going to be doing a ton of camera switching, although I'll do some, check it out. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Pamela, talk. can we hear you? Yes, I hope you can hear me. Okay, please tell me if you can't hear Pamela when it's just the big window with all Hello. Pamela all the time. And then can you hear me when I, it's just me all the time. Can you hear me talking? Okay, that's really it. And then the two of us. That's it. I'm a one man, one man band again. Uh, awesome. Cool. What's happening? How's the temperature over there in uh, the Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville? It It's in the high 20s. It's not too bad. Celsius. I high really appreciate you translating it to uh, Celsius for me. And uh, Well, I, I see everyone using Celsius in our streams, so well, it's the least I can do. It, it's it's great. Look at that. And, and Larry Beckham is saying 27 in Austin, so... Um, now I know my lower third, it's my chin. I could go shave my beard, maybe trim and the beard. You, like put the top of your head closer to the camera. Frame? See if I do, right. If I go this way, uh huh. then, then it gets, then it cuts off my head up there. So it's okay to lose some of your head. We'd rather see your head than not <laughs> see your chin. Talking like this. <laughs> um there both of us yay <clears throat> okay yeah so i won't be doing any images and there's a lot of clickety clackety noises like listen to my keyboard here like i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna comment on the chat hello chat so it's very loud we got to figure this part out next which is like a silent keyboard but uh probably use some kind of separate studio space where I go and the Chad will be relegated to this horrible bank of computers and then I'll just be staring into a camera and that's it. So anyway. And I'm I, fighting with a microphone that doesn't want to stay at the correct height. So you may slowly see my microphone go down and I'll fight with it some more whenever needed. Once again, the good stuff is back at your house. You just have all of the second audio equipment uh, here. Um, okay, so I'm gonna say hello to some people. We got all right hello to a strong wait that's me uh brian yoko <laughs> eric knapp giselle sabarin good to be bra james haney jason rambles jim meeker john s john yorn albert larry beckham lillian brennan michael collins nancy graziano ott kapelma paul gracie susan murph thomas Traniker, and tom van scotter um and apologies that we aren't doing this on Friday the way we had originally intended. Uh, I will be at Balticon. So if any of you are in on Friday. Baltimore, yep. If any of you are in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, Balticon is happening down Harborside this year. They're finally moving out of Hunts Valley and into like the shiny, awesome restaurant part of the city. And um, come check, come check things out Saturday, Sunday, Monday, I think I Presentations. I'll be sticking everything up on my blog. Right. I'm just wondering if we'll be able to do an astronomy cast, but who knows? And then I'm going to be uh, at the Bandelier uh, Astronomy Festival uh, next weekend in New okay. Mexico. So does that mean next Friday we have a problem? <laughs> Houston, we we have a problem. I, 
Anyway, we'll figure. I don't know what to do. We'll figure Houston, this out. We have too much traveling. Too much traveling. Yeah. Well, it's fine if it's just you because you can find your way to some terrible internet cafe or hotel Wi-Fi or something like that, or just like walk down the street staring up at your phone. But if it's the both of us, then it gets pretty weird because I'm trying to do this stream. So this is we've got a much better way to do the stream, but now we have a much worse way. Um, my so this is weird. I'm looking at the Wirecast, and it's giving me a count. Oh, no, it's, it's counting up. Never mind. It's saying I've, <laughs> but it's saying I've been at it for 25 minutes. That's when you and I connected to Wirecast. That's when I turned on Wirecast. Yeah, okay. All right, never mind. And this is where we, we prevent Fraser from losing his head in multiple ways. Yeah. He appears hard. So anyway, that's just that's that little piece of news for you in case you weren't aware. Uh, computers are hard and stupid, um, but Astronomy Cast is awesome. So let's uh, let's do a little thing we like to call a show. Uh, is there you've got the Balticon, so people are going to be in Baltimore can check and can before visit. Before that, and only the people listening live, does this make any sense to? Uh, if you're a functional programmer. That can be read in many different ways. I'm going to a functional programming conference in Boulder, uh, yeah. Wednesday, Thursday, yeah. uh, called MoonConf. Making so, uh, the most of that astronomy doctorate. Yes. So um, I will be giving the closing keynote at MoonConf on uh, Wednesday evening. So, yeah. Is it a conference about the moon? No, it's a conference about functional programming. Why is it called Moon? I don't know. I think it's cool, though. They have a very awesome website, which you would expect from programmers. Right. Um, okay, let's, uh, let's do this thing. Um, and I will try to switch the camera back and forth. I will try. I will try. I promise nothing. I regret nothing. Okay. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Are we boring you? No, you're super tired. You, I, you, yeah. Is it still Columbia time for you? Well, Columbia is the exact same time zone as Edwardsville, so I simply flew south via a very stupid airplane route. No, the, the real reason is that, that my elder dog woke mm, me up keep twice it, last keep night. Oh. So it, when I am her age, I hope I have someone as kind for me, yeah. so I'm hoping karma yeah. will pay forward. Yeah. Um, I forget, what were you doing? You were, like, giving the dog, like, super special treats? At this age, there was some. It's yeah. It's, well, we we've been fighting a never-ending battle to get medication into the dog. Right. So. Uh, okay. All right. Okay. Here we Are go. Are you ready to actually like do the show? I believe so. Okay. I Are prom- you ready to press record? I have pressed record. I have pressed record too, and it's mono, and it's the correct mic, and everything is good. Everything is good. Uh, yeah, I got the right mic too. Here we go. Hey, Preston. Uh, countdown till you're gone and we're going to miss you. Sorry. Yes. We are going to be hiring a new student programmer. So an audio engineer, audio engineer in training. So. All right, here we go. Astronomy cast episode 415, the temperature of the universe. Welcome to astronomy cast our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Good. How was Columbia? It was, so I was in the city of Medellin, and it was an absolutely fabulous trip. Medellin is, is a city that people are working very hard to be very proud of. It's a city that is up and coming, that they're putting in new metro, they're putting in new gondola service up the sides of the mountains. They are building fabulous museums. And it felt kind of like going to a country five years after the war ended, where everyone is proud to get to rebuild the nation into what they want it to be. And the CAP, the Communicating Astronomy for the Public meeting, um, is is an absolutely amazing meeting that we had, I want to say 23 different nations, 25 different nations worth of people. And it was cool. Awesome. 
Uh, okay, so let's go with... Uh, Oh, I've got to get my intro. Uh, so the temperature <laughs> of the universe can vary a dramatic amount from the hot cores of stars to the vast. You want to cold... redo that. Sorry, Preston. I'm going to make him redo what? that. What? <laughs> you were laughing. It sounded silly. All right. Oh, so he's going to edit this out? Yes. Like maybe he was just going to leave it in. All right. Uh, and maybe he's going to leave all this in right now. And, and it's just going to be hilarious. And people are going to see behind the scenes. All right. Preston, okay. we love you. All right. Let me take another crack at it then. Uh the temperature of the universe can vary a dramatic amount from the hot cores of stars to the vast, cold emptiness of deep space. What's the temperature of the universe now? And what will it be in the future? There. Uh, all right, Pamela, what's the temperature in the universe right now? It is 2.725 degrees above absolute zero. Do you say that? Do you say degrees above absolute zero? I was people like whenever I would write an article and I would say, you know, it's degrees Kelvin. I would the the pedants would pop out of the woodwork so, and say, you so can't you say degrees Kelvin. You don't say degrees Kelvin, but I said degrees above absolute zero, and because Celsius and Kelvin are the same size, you can I can get away with that. So more correctly would have been to say it's 2.7 ish degrees celsius above absolute zero so it's like five degrees above average in austin right now or something so when it it's nomenclature gobbledygook it was fine i would love to have that philosophical conversation with with the, <laughs> with these pedants and kind of go like is that how i'm supposed to say it then it's it's 2.7 degrees centigrade <laughs> above absolute zero Kelvin. Anyway, anyway, we're not going to go. We're not going to go down that down that road <laughs> today. We're going to uh, sort of stick to the. Uh, you know what? Just don't even think about it. Wait, uh, what I love is I say Celsius, you say centigrade when we mean the exact same thing. Well, we're going to get so many emails even on that. But they all mean the same thing, so it's okay. Just everyone, be chill, be all right. calm. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. So what I guess. So that's the temperature of the, of, the, of the universe right now. But actually, the temperature of the universe can vary a tremendous amount depending on where you are and how far away you are from any are. kind of source of – yeah, and when, and when you are. All right. So, so let's sort of find the hottest place we can possibly imagine. What do you think is like the hottest place in the oh. entire universe? So the, the, hottest, the hottest thing – the inside of a newly formed neutron star. So this this is where they have just finished um, all of the protons and electrons happily combined. They gave off a blast of extra light, radiation, particle bits, and and those electrons and protons combined into neutrons. It occurs when a white dwarf achieves a specific um, size and it happens via supernova it can also happen when a very large star collapses at the end of its life so at this moment that the neutron star is formed it is 99 billion 999 million 999,726 degrees celsius that is that is very very hot. I I've actually heard that the Large Hadron Collider and various fusion reactors Not can hotter. can yes. even get hotter. And so yeah, they do. Yeah, and so you can say that the hottest place in the universe is at CERN, but obviously so, except for the alien super mega particle accelerators, right? So so when they collide lead ions at CERN, so it's this. You have to be specifically the high mass of the lead, the high speed of the collider. When they combine lead ions in CERN, they get to 5 trillion, uh, 500 billion-ish degrees Celsius. Uh, okay, so that is the that is the, the hottest temperature in the universe. And of course, you know, uh, until the aliens send us some kind of screenshot of their super collider accelerating, uh, we take the record for the hottest temperature in the entire universe. So it's, it's true. So, and, so and take that supernova. Well, what, what's kind of amazing is 
that that we're able to get a couple orders of magnitude hotter than the universe gets in its day-to-day -day activities. Even like shortly after the Big Bang. Like well, it's short, shortly after the Big Bang, there we're looking at, I had to actually look up the words because you got, once you get past a certain number of zeros, I have to start looking, looking it up. It was roughly one octillion degrees Celsius, 10 to the negative 35 seconds after the Big Bang occurred. That is ridiculously short after the Big Bang. So for a, just a moment, then I guess the Big Bang had the hottest temperature in the universe. And then we've taken the, you know, but now that's not the hottest it can possibly be. Whoa. Is that what, what, what there's an upper limit on how hot things can be? We, we think that there's actually an absolute hot above which like normal physics as we know it is just like, I give up, I forfeit. I can't deal with this temperature anymore. This is as hot as it can be. And, and we call that the Planck temperature. And the Planck temperature is one decillion or decillion. I'm not sure how to pronounce this. We hit like I left my vocabulary behind temperatures. 420 nanillion degrees Celsius. What is the physical rationale for why that is the hottest temperature? Um, we actually talked about this back when we did our show on um, Planck lengths, Planck times. It's at a certain point, you, you hit this critical, all the forces come together, and it, it stops being even logical to start talking about things as being separate anymore. Got like it. physics just breaks down. Right. Once okay. You okay. It. It, so physics stops. Physics breaks down. I mean, you know, we talked a bit about the Planck length, and I don't want to go down this rabbit hole, right? Which is that the Planck length is this really neat sort of crossover of mathematics, but it's not necessarily a physical constraint. It's just a place where two numbers cross. It's not like the 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 uh, the way I was used, it's not the resolution of the universe, but it sounds like on the high end, high temperatures, probably you're going to get to a place where temperature no longer has meaning. Okay, so so that's like the hottest temperature, hottest temperature we've been able to produce here on Earth. But but something I always find really interesting is when you see these images in places like the Chandra X-ray Observatory, and it's looking at these galaxy clusters, and it's seeing clouds of gas coming together at millions of degrees. Yeah. But if you were to like fly through them, you wouldn't feel like you're heated up intensely. So what's going on in those situations? So so how we define temperature is is kind of crazy sometimes. Temperature is not how hot it necessarily would feel on your skin. Temperature is if you looked at all the energy tied up in the atoms, the individual particles, in terms of their energy that they can deliver to other things. That energy is what we refer to as temperature. But if the particles are so diffuse that they're not actually hitting you, you may not even notice the temperature that you're at. So an individual gamma ray has an extraordinarily high temperature because it's a gamma ray photon. But one gamma ray photon, if it hits your DNA, is going to kind of ruin that cell's day and potentially ruin your future. But most of the time, that single gamma ray is just going to go right through your body and you're never going to notice. It's when you're being bathed in photon after photon after photon, like when you're outside sunbathing, that your body's like, oh, I can tell I'm getting hit with all of these photons. So what, what really matters, the fancy word is the flux density. If the flux density or the collision rate between particles is too low, that's another way we look at it is how often are you getting hit by one of these atoms? Gamma ray is a photon of light. Um, you also have high energy ions. These are cosmic rays that come flying out of the sky single cosmic ray, again, you're not going to notice it may cause cancer down the line, which is bad, but you're not going to notice that one cosmic ray hitting you. But if you're getting hit 
with with a deluge of these high energy particles that is is going to start to exert a pressure is going to start to be noticeable and fry you so things to avoid right so if you were to like interrogate interior interrogate each individual particle it would report a temperature and you would be able to sort of figure that out to know what the temperature of that thing is but if you were to like look at like how does it feel the interior of the sun feels hotter than passing through this 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 cloud of hot gas even though it could very well be the same temperature all right so we talked about things that are very hot let's 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 talk about the insides of stars what kind of temperatures are we looking at there so so i still classify the insides of stars as very hot so so inside i of said our- it was i said it was hot you know. Well, you said cooler things, so we're still hot, though. Right, right. So, so inside our own sun, we're starting to look at uh, 15 million degrees Celsius. So, so we're pretty hot. This is where the temperatures start to um, allow uh, nuclear reactions to occur. It's also because of the densities. This is where we get back to that. You need the individual particles to have sufficient velocity. That's another way of looking at temperature is what is the average velocity of the particles. But you also have have to have sufficient density in order for the nuclear reactions to occur. So in the center of a star, we have sufficient density and sufficient temperature that it allows nuclear reactions. Got it. Uh, okay, so and, and you said, what was it, like 15 million Celsius? Yep. What's that in Kelvin? About 15 million, right? Give or take right, a few. Right, because you yeah, add a couple hundred. Give, give or take a few hundred, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. Okay. So that's hot. And now that's like the, the, the temperature inside our own sun, but you can have a, a bigger star have a hotter temperature, right? I mean. Bigger stars uh, depend. Yeah. Bigger stars have hotter cores. They also will eventually get to the point that they're doing things like. Um, we say burning, uh, having nuclear reactions with heavier and heavier elements that, again, the physics has to be a little bit different for that to happen. So we start with hydrogen burning and then work our way up the food chain and until we end up with an iron core, in which case, poof, it all goes away. Right. And hotter temperatures uh, just permit more interesting fusion reactions. You can hotter higher pressure you can you can fuse as you said up to up to iron okay uh so that's pretty hot um what about the inside of gas planets like (laughs) so so this is a a a tricky thing to get at but as near as we can tell from working through all of the the physics um jupiter probably has a core that's around twenty four thousand degrees celsius so we're looking at very hot, uh, kind of molten, crystalline, depending on the pressure. Um, one thing they talk about is you end up with hydrogen that starts acting like a metal. So you talk about metallic hydrogen inside these these gas giants. So yeah, 24,000 degrees inside the center of Jupiter. Well, I love this, that, that idea. People are always like, you know, if you could like land a spacecraft on Jupiter and then dive down through the atmosphere, could you land on the surface? Because there is probably dozens of times the mass of the Earth in rock and metal at the core of Jupiter. It's, it's down there. It's just, well, I wouldn't say rock because that <laughs> implies that sure. the... Rock heated, uh, silicon atoms heated, he, silicon yes. and, and oxygen atoms heated to enormous temperatures and mixed with molten hydrogen that acts like a metal. Yes, yes. it's 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 someplace you would die. It's, it's yeah, just, yeah, it's, yeah, and die. it's just a race to which would kill you first. But in fact, you don't have to get very deep down into Jupiter's the atmosphere pressures. where the temperatures, the pressures raise up above boiling and, and what have you, right? You just go right. down a few hundred or thousand kilometers and the temperatures start to crank up. Okay, that's inside Jupiter. What about inside our own planet? So so inside our own planet, it's it's a pulse pulsely six thousand degrees Celsius. And what's kind of interesting to think about is nuclear explosions are about ten thousand degrees Celsius. So Jupiter's core is 
about twice as hot as being at the center of a nuclear explosion, nuclear bomb. Um, the temperature inside of a conventional chemical bomb, so TNT, plastic, uh, is about 5,000 degrees Celsius. So you can actually start to say, okay, bomb explosion core of the Earth, nuclear explosion core of Jupiter. Just if you want to go there. Random facts. Now you know. Now, now you know. I believe that is half the battle. I'm not sure which half. Um, so, okay, so we've got uh, inside the core of our Earth, which sometimes, of course, we get volcanoes and it oozes up and we get uh, we get to see how hot that stuff is. Uh, and, and there is a great, man, over on the Nerdist channel, uh, have you ever seen their their science channel? Kyle Hill d did a great thing about what happened if you l jumped into lava and that, you know, that because you're landing on rock, it wouldn't be like you splashing into water. You'd more just kind of smack onto the top of the rock and then explode in fire. And it would just be a really awful way to go. So, so don't jump in lava. Like once it's again, kind of your imagination is a, yeah, your imagination is of no help to you when you think about what it would be like to actually interact with lava. Okay. So that's the interior of the planet. We can assume, you know, Mars is probably a little cooler inside. Uh, yeah. so let's, let's talk about like a, the hottest atmosphere. Now let's talk about, uh, Oh, Venus. <laughs> so 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 venus is kind of um hot um it's it's the mariner 2 data so what what i love about the temperature of venus is if you go back and you read old science fiction books they talk about venus as this tropical resort planet and this is based on plain old atmospheric models of it's closer to the, the sun than we are. It's about the same size we are. Didn't think about greenhouse gas properties at all. Then when Little Mariner 2 got there, it realized that it's like 900 degrees Fahrenheit, 460 degrees Celsius. It is a world of death. So do not go to Venus. And unfortunately, so many like Tropical paradise dreams were completely broken by that little spacecraft. Yeah, but unless you go into the high alt, you know, the high atmosphere, you end up at there's like a perfect altitude where you can have both the temperature and the pressure be Earth like, you know, and sulfuric acid fill. And you can only breathe carbon dioxide, uh, but but oxygen, breathable air, is a lifting gas. You can have a balloon. You can sit outside in and in, in your protective suit. As, as it rots away from the sulfuric acid uh, briefly and enjoy the view from the clouds. So uh, it is, you know, people always ask you, like, what's the most Earth-like place in the, in, the, in the solar system? It is the cloud tops of Venus. I would, I would I, rather stand there than on the surface of Mars. I, I, you know, I'm kind of for the deepest valley on Mars because that's where you, you have... The um, thickest atmosphere. So we have the thickest yeah. atmosphere and middle of summer on Mars is warmer than a Boston winter day. So I'm, I'm thinking, put me down in the body at bottom of one of those valleys, one of those craters, and I'll call it good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so then, of course, we're going to do a we'll, we'll very quickly pass through the temperature of our own uh, atmosphere here on Earth it, right it's now. True. Right now, it's kind of cold here. It can range in temperature here on the west coast of Canada from like, I don't know, 33 Celsius down to minus 15 Celsius. But like the average temperature of the Earth is what? It's, it's the average temperature of the Earth, I believe, is in the 20s Celsius. Hmm. So uh, that's a nice, you know, the literally the only place we found in the entire universe that's even marginally hospitable to life could very well be it so uh that it's, that it's true that's sad you know when people say like the universe is perfect for life it's so not right like we've talked about all these horrible hellish hot temperatures and now we're about to talk about awful cold temperatures we got this little place all right well, let's go to and, and what's what's crazy is a lot of these hot temperatures are are like the melting point of silver is 960 degrees so venus's atmosphere is only twice the melting point of, of silver. It's it's the boiling point of mercury is 357 degrees Celsius. So so we're looking at temperatures where bad stuff happens. Um, 
yeah, it, it's, it's kind of crazy. But even here on the surface of our Earth, if you had to guess, what is the temperature of the hottest part of a wax candle flame? Like your normal, go to a restaurant where they don't have the LED candles yet. How hot do you think the hottest bright blue part of that flame is? Is this a test? Um, yes. I'm going to guess. It's my turn. Okay, 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 okay. I'm going to say it is uh, 1,000 degrees. Unit, please. Oh, Celsius. Okay. Um, you you got two thirds of the way there. Okay. It's 1,400 degrees Celsius. Right. So so that candle, if you could get your silver in the exact right part of the candle flame you could like melt melt you your silver melt. i want to do this <laughs> <laughs> um all right so we were talking we were talking hot we passed through lukewarm and room temperature and comfort and now let's move into cold so let's okay. go to the atmosphere of mars oh i don't have that number in front of me sorry Preston. minus hundreds of degrees it can be right it can be Anywhere from like minus 100 Celsius, uh, even colder at the poles at night. Okay, I, I've got the average temperature. That's all I wanted. Okay. Okay, sorry, Preston. Sorry, Preston. Okay, yes, sometimes we Google things mid-show. Um, okay, so so for Mars, we're, we're looking at some place that it's actually a temperature we get to on Earth, but it's a temperature you don't want to experience on Earth, and it's that temperature year-round. And that temperature, on average is minus 55 degrees celsius for those of you who speak fahrenheit we're now down to minus 67 degrees fahrenheit the two temperature systems cross at minus 40 which you experience if you go to michigan state every year in february well ironically right the temperature on in canada in winnipeg sometimes can be colder than the temperature on mars that the, a couple of years yeah. ago, the temperature of, of Winnipeg was colder than what the Curiosity rover was experiencing at the time. The, the day, I don't remember if it was spirit or opportunity, one of the days that one of those two first landed, I was in Boston, and they were talking uh, on, on Science Friday about the temperature on Mars, and I realized it was warmer on Mars, and I was kind of wishing I could be there with those little rovers, because it was cold in Boston. Yeah, I'm sure Curiosity is like, ha ha, suckers, come back, to, come over to Mars. <laughs> um, all right, so that's Mars is cold, but it is definitely not the coldest place in the solar system. So as we move further and further out to the outer edges of the solar system, how cold do we get? Well, it, it's one of these things where, first of all, how, how far out do you want to go? Because when you start getting out to the Oort cloud, we're starting to get down pretty close to the average temperature of the universe. But it's, it's a one over R squared process. So every time you double your distance, the amount of light that you're getting from the sun um, goes down by a factor of four. So it's, it gets worse and worse the further out you go. And by the time you get out to, to Pluto, our friendly neighborhood Kuiper Belt object, um, we're now down to minus 218 degrees Celsius, which is minus 360 degrees Fahrenheit. And what? how much is that? It's, that's only a few dozen degrees above absolute zero at this point, right? Yeah, it's it's pretty darn cold. Pretty, pretty darn cold. Okay, so though, and that's sort of within our solar system. So now as we start to get out into the interstellar gulfs between the regions between the stars, the temperature drops even more dramatically. The only thing that's really heating us up at this point is the temperature from the stars. Right. So, so if you imagine that, that you are in the intergalactic voids, this, these parts of the universe where you're no longer in a galaxy, you're nowhere near a star, you just see all this distant light. While you are getting photons from those galaxies, from those stars, the number of those photons is so low that it's not really heating you up at all. And, and in fact, you're, you're sinking down toward the mean temperature of our entire universe, which is that cosmic microwave background radiation at about 2.7 degrees above absolute zero. Which is really, really, really cold. 
But it's uh, not the coldest place in the universe. No, once again, like the hottest place in the universe, the coldest place in the universe is really close to home. And and it's as far as we know, it's the Boomerang Nebula, which is about five thousand light years away. And it's acting like a heat pump, just pumping all of the warmth out of it and super cooling the center the same way your air conditioning unit does in the summer. It just doesn't have your electricity bill. So it's colder than the background temperature of the universe. It, wow, it, that's amazing. Heat pumps will do that. No, but okay. So, so that's <laughs> naturally occurring coldest place in the universe, which right. is amazing. That is yes. mind bending. But we've we've done a whole show on Bose Einstein condensates. Just this idea that you can cool things down. We've we've had a whole show on absolute zero. You can get pretty close to absolute zero with lasers. It's true. You you can pretty much stop atoms almost from moving, and they're still they have some temperature because you can't stop them from moving altogether, but uh, you can lock them into states where they're pretty darn close to, to absolute zero. But I, I have to say, we're, we're about to skip over my absolute favorite random science fact. Oh, well, please tell me what it is. <laughs> so, so that, that uh, minus 272 degrees Celsius, that is, is the temperature that you get at for the boomerang nebula. The extremophile, the water bear tardigrade, these cute little critters that kind of look like uh, they came straight out of uh, the first airbender. Um, we know that those little critters can actually live to minus 273 degrees Celsius and be resurrected from that experience. So it turns out that this little extremophile that seems to be pretty much impossible to kill can survive the coldest naturally occurring places in our universe. That's why they really make ideal candidates for these these upcoming Alpha Centauri probes that we talked about, right? They're small. <laughs> they don't mind extreme temperatures either way. Uh, they're ready to go. They're ready to go to Alpha Centauri for us. They will colonize the universe. <laughs> um, so we, we passed through, uh, but so we talked about the cold, you know, the coldest place in the lab, people use lasers, they cool things yeah. down to just a teeny tiny fraction above absolute zero. Yes. So let's sort of to wrap this up, let's talk just a second about time, which is that right now, here we are 13.8 billion years after the Big Bang, the temperature that 2.7 Kelvin is how far the universe has cooled to by now. Yes. But it's going to get cooler and cooler over time, right? It, it is. And over the fullness of time, and here we're looking at trillions of degrees, it's going to very slowly work its way down toward without actually achieving absolute zero. So, so in terms of putting it into Celsius, which is where all of our brains seem to be working today, absolute zero is at minus 273.15 degrees. The coldest we've gotten in a laboratory so far is minus 273.144 degrees. So we've gotten really close to absolute zero, but it took a whole lot of energy and a whole lot of work to do that because we had to essentially counteract all of the different internal momentums in that atom to get it to stop jiggling, moving, all of that absolutely as much as possible. Um, it was actually a copper vessel that they managed to super cool in, in India. Um, the universe, as far as we know, uh, doesn't have a bunch of external lasers ready to like start slapping around the atoms and say, stop vibrating. So our own ability to get that cool, we're probably not going to get that cool in the fullness of time. But we're going to slowly slow down so that all you have left is the random vibrations of isolated atoms. And the universe in the far, far future will have reached the coldest possible temperature. But I guess when it, when it hits inf infinite time. Yes. So at infinite time, we will have the coldest possible temperature, which will be essentially absolute zero. And, and part of the reason I'm being kind of vague and squirrely on this is there's a lot we don't know about how the universe will end. We know it's it, when we first started filming Astronomy Cast, it was we didn't know if it was by fire or by ice. Then 
we've eventually figured out we do live in a forever expanding, actually accelerating apart universe. Well, we knew that when we started recording, but there were still some open questions. And we now know we're certainly going to die by heat death of the universe, which means everything freezes. But what we don't know is do protons, one of the fundamental building blocks of the universe, do they actually decay or not? If they decay, that means that eventually all the atoms in the universe end up just poofing off into energy. Now, every year that goes by without detecting the decay of a proton is another year that says, no, protons aren't going to decay. They're actually forever stable. But without knowing that, it's, it's, it's hard to say, is the universe going to someday be a bunch of cold, isolated atoms, or is it going to be nothing more than a background of low-level radiation? And it's, it's amazing what we don't know, and this is why we keep doing science. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks, Pamela. We'll talk to you next week. My pleasure, Fraser. I'll talk to you later. Right. And now we save. Now we save. Stay tuned. Don't We're sorry to subject you to this every single week, but this is what happens Damn. when you watch us record an audio show live over YouTube. They they are taking notes for how they can do their <laughs> own podcasts. It's true. Yeah. So remember to save. It's, it's our tip to you. Um, and remember to turn your uploading back on, which both of us forgot to do last week. Okay. All right. No, I, I'm still talking to them. You're fine. <laughs> I'm sharing my office with my project manager, who I will not embarrass by turning the camera. And he thought I had started talking to him. Uh, um, all right. Uh, people find that very weird when I'm like walking down the road and I've got my, my headset on and I'm like having conversations with people on the phone and I'm like just like, look like a crazy person talking. Because I'm not even on a phone, right? I'm just like talking while I'm walking down yeah. the street and I've got some kind of weird slave collar around my neck. So um, a yoke, a yoke, like a big yeah, oh, it's, ox it's yoke. It's one yeah. of these things. Oh, yeah. I, I think love you and I have yep. almost the same ones. I do love that. It's the LG. They have a whole series yeah. of them. If you're looking for a Bluetooth speaker that works awesome, that machine right there is the greatest. And they and they're not even paying us. They really should. Um, no, it's they're it's truly yeah, awesome. Because it because it hangs on your shoulders and so it's not like it's trying to pull out of your ear. It's not like the weight is coming on your ears. It hangs on your shoulders and then they go up like like little um like just little earbuds into your ears. And and, you, and you don't like my greatest problems are are twofold if i have corded earbuds i will catch them on a doorknob and once pull you, you pull the phone out yeah and it goes down the stairs or into the toilet or whatever yeah no i know i i have done more harm to phones ears cables yeah. this way um and then if you have like your normal bluetooth headphones which which i love and i wear all the time um but you leave your house like an idiot. You look, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And you can't wear a bike helmet or a horseback riding helmet over your normal Bluetooth headphones. And the thing I like is you press the button on the side and it opens up your conversation with Google Voice, Google Now. Yeah. And so I'll like I'll click it and then I'll I'll say like make a phone call or um what is the average temperature of Mars and and it'll just put it in my ear. And it's gotten pretty good too. So I've been doing some pretty complicated conversations with it. So anyway, that's it. That yeah. is the uh, that is the device that we both uh, love, and and uh, I hope LG continues making those things because uh, yes. I've gone through a bunch. Yes. Um, okay, cool. So let's get on to some questions. Um, remember, if you want to get a question in, try to put in the little question mark icon as you do things. Um, I see someone was talking about uh, the flat Earth. Um, uh, yeah, it's not flat. W once again, they, they, no one actually believes that. They are just trolling hard. So they, they're just trying to they, – they, it's a hilarious joke to get people to, to get mad about it. But, but Margot yeah. Robinson actually has a really good question if you see it. 
Well, hold on. I'm coming down through. Um, so Joe Kazana says, uh, Hi, Fraser. I was watching some old Babylon 5 and Universe Today popped up on several episodes. Are you and them related? No, we're not. Uh, I came up with that. That is so deeply pleasing as the Babylon 5. Uh, I know. I yeah. know. I, it, it, so I was a huge fan of Babylon 5, but I never noticed the Universe Today was the newspaper in it. Because it's just like, you know, it's just done in a couple of yeah. things. And so I literally, when I started Universe Today, I just took space words and time words and I just p mixed and matched them together and looked for domain names that were available. And and Universe and Today were the only, was was one of them that was available. And there was, that a, yeah, space currently and things, you know, like awful combinations. And then later on, it sort of occurred to me that, uh, that they were the same. Um, so there you go. Let's see. Uh, yeah, so Morgan Robinson asks, how did the average, how was the average temperature calculated? How did the temperature? I, so, so in this case, it's a matter of where do most of the photons come from. And most of the photons come from the cosmic microwave background. And we've mapped out the entire sky uh, enough times to get at the the average temperature of the cosmic microwave background is that 2.725 degrees celsius the gist Above of absolutely. wmap and planck and all of these these spacecraft is that they yes. are a really sensitive thermometer kobe that's another kobe, one. kobe yeah and oh. all they're doing is they're just looking at every little spot of the sky and saying what's the temperature and and if and back in the day it was a very rough instrument and so it was all like it was like a, around three degrees was was what they were or sorry yeah a, around three once again yeah. I'm being falling into this this quicksand of temperature but it, around three degrees and then it was was until recently i mean with these new spacecraft they're looking for finer and finer differences in those in those temperatures and it's that's how they discovered things like the the weird cold spot and the axis of evil and and but also the fact that the universe doesn't wrap around on itself that you don't see you know all these things they've been looking for and it's all just about those really minute temperature variations so the next generation of them will take it to more decimal places right yep um beep, boop. let's see so Margaret Robinson also asks, what would happen if the universal maximum temperature was exceeded? Uh, physics would stop. Like, we don't know. Physics doesn't let us know. It's sort of like we don't know what's inside of a black hole. Physics is like, yeah. Just our, our current theories don't extend into those realms. What happens when all of the forces of the universe break down and become whatever they were in the first few nano moments after the Big Bang? Exactly. Yeah. Let's find out. No. No. <laughs> no. No. I mean, to put that much energy into one place. Um, I, I don't want to pay the electricity bill. We. we <laughs> it's bad enough with CERN. <laughs> yeah. I wonder though if that's what the if that's the cause of the great filter. If that's what kills the uh, the other alien races. They're like, I wonder how hot we can make things. Uh, Michael Meyer asks: Is the metallic hydrogen responsible for Jupiter's magnetic field? No. Okay. Well, I mean, it's part of it, but it's not the fact that they have metallic hydrogen. It's the fact that they have a bunch of uh, ions moving in uh, an internal gyro, basically. Right. Uh, rotating, always yeah. turning. Uh, Larry Beckham asks, what was the last temperature from the probe that melted in Jupiter? So I guess when Galileo crashed into Jupiter, how hot did it get? I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I don't remember what the last moments of, of Galileo were. Just Googling it now. Can't you hear? Yeah. Um, and you want to Google this with the word mission. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, they don't say. No. During the f 57 minutes of data collecting, Galileo returned some surprising data on Jupiter's atmosphere. But what surprising data? End. 
this this is something we will need to do more research on. Um, apparently, we need to do a show on the death of Galileo. The yeah, mission. yeah, it discovered a new radiation belt, only thirty one thousand or fifty thousand kilometers above Jupiter's cloud tops. No solid surface was detected during the one hundred fifty six. So it only made it one hundred fifty six kilometers down through the atmosphere, and then uh, it died. And then it died. Yeah, pressure. Uh, the wind speed was really high. Um, less lightning, less water, more wind. Uh, and the wind speeds were up to 350 kilometers per hour. So it was awful. Yeah, it really... Sorry we did that to you, Galileo. That was rough. But we did protect all the little worlds from being contaminated by tardigrades. Right, right. They don't die. No, the tardigrades, tardigrades are planning their future mission. Um, William Vanderbeek says, didn't they recently discover that the poles of Venus are cooler? Yeah, they did. I don't know if you heard about this, that the they found there was some like a vortex at Venus where the temperatures are a little cooler than, than that average temperature across the whole world. Did you hear that? No? We did. Yeah. We did. We covered that in the weekly space hangout. It's fairly new research. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, Richard Strasslas, is there a place in Antarctica where it's cold enough to freeze carbon dioxide? No. The maybe briefly. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Let me see. Uh, one, minus 78 degrees Celsius is when it freezes. So we get that on Mars. I mean, the, the ice caps yeah. on Mars are made of water and with a nice snow of carbon dioxide of, of, that falls out of them when the when it's wintertime there. And, and you have to have the combo of correct pressure, temperature. So I'm seeing the lowest temperature recorded on Earth um, – was at ground level was minus 89.2 degrees Celsius from the Soviet Vostok station on Antarctica. So that would be dry ice yeah. temperatures. Yeah. I just don't so you, know if the pressure and such was in favor of that. And if there was very much, I mean, there's not a yeah. lot of carbon dioxide, uh, even though it's causing all this global warming, the actual percentage of the atmosphere that is carbon dioxide is fairly low. But maybe you got a little dusting of dry ice. That's an interesting question. Uh, yeah. That sounds like a whole other episode. I should do that in an episode on the guide to space on that. I'll, I'll dig into it. I like that topic. So, so according to Tech Times, dry ice does not exist naturally anywhere on Earth. There you go. Uh, Valdegast asks, any chance of doing a show like this but talking about density? Hmm. Um. Lowest density to highest density. Start with black holes. Go yeah. down. Go to the. That one would take a fair amount of research, but yeah, we could do that. Yeah, I like that topic. Consider it uh, tentatively. Add to the list. Yeah, Valdegast is saying that uh, tardigrades can't survive in your bloodstream. That is good to know. <laughs> good to know. <laughs> ha! In your face, our water bear overlords. <laughs> um, Michael Meyer asks, "What about negative temperatures?" Um, so you can't have negative Kelvin because physics says no. Right. But the, you know, the definition of absolute zero, which is the lowest possible temperature, is the place where you, you know, it's not that the molecules have stopped, but it's where you can no longer extract any energy, energy. out of the system. Right. So, yeah, I don't know. Negative... Negative. Yeah, you can't have negative temperatures, Kelvin. Okay. But I'm sure there's some thing where, like, people... No, have... there is no thing. You cannot go colder than absolute zero. That is why it is called absolute zero. Um... Yeah, but some place where you've got, yeah, like, no, a temperate... No, no, <laughs> no. No. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at an article... No. <laughs> All right. Okay. You can say anything on the internet. I'm trying to keep you into the realm of science. 
Okie doke then. Just saying. All right. Okay. Um, Paul Gracie wants to know how well tardigrades follow directions. They don't. They are, <laughs> they are the Captain Kirk. But slime mold follows directions. So, slime, slime mold, mold obeys, but uh, tardigrades, those, uh, you know, they're lone wolves. They, they break all the rules. Um, ooh, good question. William Vandebeek asks, does the dark matter of the Milky Way have a temperature? Does, the, does dark matter have a temperature? So it it it's defined by motion and collision so yes it has a temperature i have no clue how to measure it right because it, it doesn't have... give off any photons so we can't tell it's temperature. not exactly a black body <laughs> um <laughs> or it is the yeah it is the blackest body no temperature at all so we can't measure the temp it gives off no radiation no electromagnetic radiation so we can't tell the temperature yeah it's well we'd have to be able to measure its its kinetic energy and you can only do that if you can actually find one so good luck so so shortly after you get your nobel prize you get to uh figure out um your second nobel prize knowing what the temperature of dark matter is congratulations um Margot Robinson asks, how are the expansion of the universe and the heat death of the universe related? So as, as the universe expands, the wavelength of the light that's flying through it, so, so that cosmic microwave background energy that we were talking about, it actually expands with the expansion of, of the universe, which is part of why the cosmic microwave background is getting colder and colder and colder over time. So we're stretching the light out and increasing the volume of space that energy has to fill. And if you increase the volume, the energy has to fill, then in any given point, you're going to have less energy over time, which means lower temperatures over time. So by expanding it, you're lowering the temperature. Now, in a much more tangible sense, this is also like the the standard gas law so if you take your can of aerosol anything cooking spray the dust stuff you use on your keyboard i'm hoping that you're now starting to use more spray stuff um instead of aerosol stuff but um if you spray the aerosol onto your hand it's always cold and that's because you have compressed gas that is radically expanding and as it expands it drops in temperature so this is just one of those things uh, Paul Gracie asks, what is the average temperature of a rogue planet out between star systems? It's, it's going to depend on how old it is. So when a planet first forms, you have uh, gravity pushing down is part of what's generating heat. You also have the stuff that it formed out, started out with a given temperature. But over time, it's going to radiate away all of that heat. So Mars used to be much warmer, but it radiated away, radiated away its heat. Earth, a lot of our surface temperature is a mix of ground radiating heat due to radiation breakdowns, heating up the soil and sunlight coming down. So the temperature we're at is a combination of our planets warm for more than just the sun and we have sunlight hitting us. So even if you killed our sun, we'd stay warm for a while now given the fullness of time, it's going to cool off to the background temperature of the universe, which is that, well, whatever the background temperature of the universe is at the moment that the planet is dead cooling off. Um, okay. Whoa, this is lots of good conversation now. <laughs> um, and, and we're at three o'clock just to... Uh, okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, man, there's so many good questions, though. Um, temperature out on Pluto, we covered that. Um, let's see. Temperature in the seas of Europa. Uh, so, uh, it's above zero. Freight of the Ed asks, yeah, what is the temperature? It's above zero, right? It has yeah. to be liquid, which is awesome. So, no. yeah. How much of it is at one temperature is going to depend on um, the the size of the central core. 
Um, so there's lots of things we're still trying to figure out, but we know it's above zero. Uh, Bob Harkins asks, does dark energy have a temperature? I, I, I don't think dark energy is a particle. And if you're not a particle, you can't really have an energy. But an energy, I mean, it's almost like it's a misnomer, right? Cause yeah, it's just a misnomer. Yeah. It's, you don't you don't talk about the kinetic energy of dark energy. You don't talk about the black body spectrum of dark energy. Yeah. Uh, dark energy is a thing. Valdegas says, I still think it's a bad idea to kill off the sun. Well, since the dawn of time, mankind has wished to destroy the sun. But it's Mr. True. Burns was able to do the next best thing and just block it out. So. Um, okay. I think we're done okay yeah we're done okay cool so uh weekly space hangout on friday is there more learning space attitude coming up um there will be but our next show is not yet scheduled so okay. stay tuned okay um and you're traveling friday i'm gonna be traveling with us next week sorry um we'll do what we can but now that i've done the show solo here without chad i feel a lot safer that i can actually do this so as long as i just leave it on the screen with the two of us it's all it's all good once i get really complicated and like put up a <laughs> x-ray pulsar in front of your face then it gets a lot more complicated i always wanted to be an x-ray pulsar you're now a binary pulsar it's a good thing to do um, but that, because that's what last week, that's what Chad was doing. He was like whipping up pictures of stuff while we were talking about it. He was like reading your mind. The guy's a beast. Um, okay, cool. Well, I think we're done. Thank you everyone for watching. Uh, and thanks to everybody who participated in my Patreon campaign, The Universe Today. So uh, I put an ad at the beginning of Astronomy Cast last week and it was great. And I really appreciate the support. Uh, if you haven't, if you missed that, just go to patreon.com slash universe today and you can support what I do which is Guide to Space and Universe Today and things like this and so on and so forth. I've uh, been at it for 17 years. I plan to continue. And, and thank you for everyone who is continuing to donate to Astronomy Cast. Uh, you make it possible for us to play, pay Preston and to pay whoever comes after Preston. And we are going to be hiring a new student to help them get their career off to a great start. Um, you're also helping to pay for the transcripts. You're helping to pay for Susie. You're helping to pay for the servers. Um, it all adds up. And periodically, you enable us to do things like go and give workshops on podcasting and to spread the good word of science wherever we go. So thank right you. Right on. All your great donations. All right. Thank you, everyone. We will see you all next week.